I Wanna Jump Like Dee Dee, with me, Jar Sibold, is the music podcast that does music a bit differently. I'm talking to some incredible musicians, DJs and producers about how they use an experimental mindset to fuel their own creativity, pursue new challenges, overcome fears, bounce back from mistakes. So my guest today started a life in, um, in music from a pretty young age, playing in the um, hardcore noise bands, uh, Shoppers and Perfect Pussy, um, and having also a solo release called Took the Ghost to the Movies. Um, she's a writer, she's formed her own record label, been a presenter and anchor on MTV. She's really, for me, like an arch collaborator. And I've got to mention the, one of the later collaborations, which I think is absolutely superb, was with Aisha and Faye from uh, Savages and Nick Zinner from Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs, which was a cover of Goldie and Skepta's Road Trip. And now she's director of music at Kickstarter. So if that's not enough to be going on with, I don't know what is. So I'm really kind of happy to welcome Meredith Graves. Meredith, hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Did I, I capture everything there? I'm not sure if I captured that. Did I capture everything? You got, if that's your take on it, you know, all the great, like, I already have started on a terrible foot. I sound like a jackass. I'm about to compare myself to like, <laughs> in the most abstract, maybe abject way. Uh, you know how like the grandmaster would paint a painting and then a student would copy it and then a student would copy it. Yeah. And would copy it. Like, that's how we, <laughs> a lot of what's in museums. I feel like every time someone else has to explain what I do. What do you do? It's always like, hmm, what do I do? That's interesting. Maybe I, I learn know. I learn something every time because it's like Meredith Graves is four raccoons in a trash bag and occasionally bakes muffins. Like I don't yeah. know. <laughs> what would I say? But yeah, that's that's me. That's a Wait, lot. So it's 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 funny, isn't it? Because I I remember the there's some of the stuff that I've been I've been, you know, kind of writing about, which is um you know, we, we define ourselves by our job. And I've just fallen into the arch trap and described everything that you've done from a kind of, I suppose, a, a in a way, a kind of work point of view. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that, and, and actually when, when you're doing so many things, it's actually really difficult to describe what do you do? I don't know, I found that myself, I, I, I don't know. I do lots of different things and there's not a little box to tick. No. No, there's definitely not. And as so long as we kind of operate within a world that prioritizes whatever box is ticked in terms mm. of, you know, shorthand, everybody wants to be something. What do you want to be when you grow up? We don't sit here and prattle off a list. Usually yeah. we get a note home to our parents. Not that I know from experience. Don't look at me like that. Okay. <laughs> but I can't take a box either. And it gives me terrible anxiety. I have to write a bio for yeah. a conference recently. And I had to contain it to 50 words. <sighs> And I'm like, less than a tweet to talk about 33 years of mistakes. Y'all got to, I'm six feet tall. You got to give me some room. <laughs> but like, yeah. Also, another thing is all the words people have come up with for that are terrible. Mm. Polymath. Yeah. Light. If you look those up in the thesaurus, you see virgin. <laughs> so, yes. You know, I, uh, I do a lot of stuff though. And to wit, um, I'm doubling back now, but when you do describe things like that, I don't necessarily see it as that's just yeah. me in a work context. Because I know. I'm incapable of separating everything. Because it's your life. Yeah. Everything else I do. And so maybe it's good to just rattle off a list. Yeah. That's I read a, I read a book, a book um, uh, a year or two ago by um, an author, Emma Gannon. It was called um, The Multi Hyphen Life. And mm -hmm. I'd actually never heard of that term, multi hyphen. I didn't I didn't know what it meant um and it's and it's basically somebody who does lots of different things mm -hmm. and it's it still like doesn't really make it because like a hyphen to me is like you know it's kind of punctuation and I didn't I didn't really kind of get it and it so it still doesn't fill a you know it just doesn't seem really satisfactory to describe what do you, what, what is a person who does loads of different things you, you kind of can't do it yeah, I'm probably less of a multi-hyphen person than I am a multi-interabang person. <laughs> <laughs> just put a huge exclamation point or an upside down dollar sign after everything I do. Just like yeah. So with with um, so you've, you've been at um, if we can talk about Kickstarter, you've been at Kickstarter for what three three, three years? This week. It oh was, wow! Like if you can believe this, I started on May Day. That should have been people's first warning. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but three years, three years this week, I've been uh, director of music. I yeah, it's, it's and it, cool, coolest job in the world. 
Is, is, this, is this your your sort of first time in a kind of corporate, if you want to call it a corporate kind of environment? Personally, um, mm -hmm. kind of, yeah, I think yeah. so. Uh, working at MTV was fascinating. Oh, yeah, of course, yes. Well, well, during MTV days, I was in a newsroom, of course. Mm. I grew up in a newsroom. My father was a local news anchor in the mm. news director my entire life. So just hanging out with reporters on a TV set or going to a live hit where you got the one camera guy, the one reporter, micing himself up and all that. Yeah. That's why I just walked into it. Like, I would have been absolutely petrified to take that job had I not grown up with a dad who was a reporter. So yeah, yeah. That is different for me. I do personally separate out the idea of working in a newsroom, which just kind of feels like a family reunion. It was really comfortable mm. with this, which is like, we're a fancy company. Like I walk in to do my interview mm. and there's a garden on the roof and I'm like, <laughs> am I allowed to sit on the furniture? You know? So yeah, in that way, yeah. my first foray into fancy town. Into fancy, fancy town. Fancy uh. town. <laughs> and, and, and what, what um, I mean, what's going on with Kickstarter now? What are, what are you kind of involved with? literally everything it's amazing because i'll put it this way on any given day just me alone i'm personally helping let's say two artists with a 40-year collaborative career launch a tarot deck that's fully photographed and every prop and every costume in it, every individual picture was handmade, forged and sewn by those artists alongside talks with two legacy hardcore bands. One's doing a box set, one's doing a documentary film. I'm talking to a classical Grammy winning composer and I'm hooking a group of radical astrologers up with a Wow. another person to talk about a different project and I'm having some meetings where I'm learning a lot of things about data and like that's just me and that's just like two hours of a Tuesday yeah yeah but beyond that what we're up to at Kickstarter is the same and totally different than what we've been up to for the last 12 years which is yeah. helping artists bring creative projects to life yeah through our wildly consistent and super customizable platform along with the work we do as a public benefit corporation via our mm. charter so mm. we are up to putting people before profit, helping artists make things that totally slap and trying to do good in the world, environmentally, yeah. culturally, trying to sort of uh, level the playing field, make it easy for independent artists of all backgrounds to get their work made and done and have a little bit of exciting fun while they're doing it. At least that's what I try to do every day, so. I mean, that's that's incredible. I mean, the, the um, I mean, how, how, have you, how have you found it, you know, over the, over the past year? you know which you, you know has obviously seen a lot of artists you know sort of struggle now i mean is this is this do you feel this is where kind of kickstarter sort of comes into its own you know for, for that that kind of like um you know kind of empathetic angle you know you want to help the people you want to help and, and your background as well which is very diy and and you know i would imagine that's that's really kind of helping now yeah i mean let me say when this whole thing started uh, it is a thing, isn't it? The whole thing. I mean, I'm thinking, <laughs> watch me mentally time travel as I'm speaking. <laughs> picture with my hands where we're, woo, we're, yeah. moving, <laughs> we're moving back in time now, Giles. Let's go, right? <laughs> um, when the whole thing started, when everyone's panic started, when we began to talk about what if they really make us stay home for the next X amount of what's going to yeah. happen, the first major red flag to go up was South by Southwest getting canceled for the first yeah. time. Mm. When I say the thing, I mean the onset of like media getting involved, suddenly everyone's talking, the industry start to shut down and music yeah. is canary in the coal mine, right? So immediately recognizing my role and more importantly, the community of collaborators and coworkers that I have there at Kickstarter, immediately recognizing our legacy and our stability and our ability to intercede in that moment. Mm. I have to say it was absolutely incredible to be in a working situation when the pandemic started to close in around us, where I knew that we had already established ourselves as a force in this exact way, where we were already like ready and waiting to be a safe mm. for some people. People had projects in the works launching and ending and all sorts yeah. of stuff happening beyond, during and after the initial announcements all the way through the last year. We have stepped our game up. We immediately started to act on and develop really cool programming for people who needed encouragement or support or ideas. We started to write everything from supportive and informative articles about how people on the platform are still doing well despite the crisis. We spun up prompts like Inside Voices that encouraged creators to launch new and smaller scale projects, things mm -hmm. they could make at home. And then a couple months in, 
I was lucky enough to work with some really, really brilliant people on an endeavor that we spun up that eventually ended up helping over a hundred people and institutions all over the world called Lights mm. On that was specifically, at least at first, for music venues. And that was something that began here in Brooklyn with my friends over at St. Vitus when yeah. they were wonderful, wonderful creative people. You know, I've been lucky enough to be in bands that sometimes got to play Vitus, but moreover, I've yeah. gone to shows there and I started to panic about all my favorite venues, all the venues in the world, everyone's oh. favorite venues shutting down. Yeah. So we got in the weeds with Vitus and we spun up based on nothing that didn't exist already, all of our existing platform functions and no rules broken, even though it was me, a kind of new way to think about Kickstarter via our tools and what could be done with them if mm. you just didn't do what everyone else was doing. Mm. And we ran a campaign called St. Vitus Stays Home that ended up blowing up and helping them tremendously to stay afloat during the last year. And this spiraled into a prompt uh, a big community yeah. endeavor that we called Lights On that eventually wow. supported over 100 venues as far as Tokyo and South America. Wow. All a little money and got some help staying open during the pandemic. And I had, you know, me and my buddies over here and I felt so, I feel so lucky every day that helping people yeah. is my full-time job. But on that, Kickstarter was like, we want to help independent music venues. And they mm -hmm. all kind of circled the wagons and we were off. So yeah, this is a cool moment to work at Kickstarter. I'm sorry, I'm just like, no, you know, it's been a year absolutely. now, and I'm still very like, oh my god, I work here at this place where people are so incredibly innovative and helpful. But yeah, it feels like if you're, we're going to keep doing a capitalism, I work at a pretty great place, yeah. especially in this current moment where, as we've seen over the last year, tremendous help can come from crowdfunding and community funding platforms for artists mm -hmm. of all media, all backgrounds, all disciplines. I mean, I mean, it, it sounds like you know this. This is this is a like a brilliant example of, <clears throat> you know, kind of community building, you know, kind of, you know, at a at a local level, but also going, going kind of global as well. You know, where you, you know, kind of identifying, you know, around the world and locally, where you know people have the same issue, people, venues, whatever, have the same issues that they're kind of facing, and it's an it's a realization that, you know building that community and collaborating the, the sum of those parts is is so kind of strong mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and because we are such a devoutly global international company from the yeah. people who work here to the countries where we're active to yeah. all of that it's a place where people from all over the global arts community come to connect and show their work to each other too so when i say i'm so blessed to help people all day mm -hmm. long i mean people all over the world and what yeah, the, everyone is facing the same kind of creative struggles. So it's kind of what, what what do you feel that in in, in that in that that the, you know over the time that you've been there, I, I guess sort of particularly this this last year because that's it's been so, um, you know, the world has been sort of turned around so much. But what what do you feel that that this has given you personally? You know, kind of what what you know development, what skills, you know, what what kind of benefits have you got it got from it personally from the last year of life or yeah yeah and and and, and being in and building those kind of communities and collaborating so much oh, God. i don't want to be donald downer but i've gotten the sense that there's so much more work to be done <laughs> yeah oh, really? yeah okay i've gotten the sense of oh my god that was just the first boss and this is a very yeah. long game right it's a long ass game and the problem mm. Is. What I've really gained a sense of, here's another thing, Donald Downer the <laughs> second. Uh, people have no idea how bad it was before mm. this started. People do not understand why we actually don't even have stats on musicians and health insurance. Who gets to call themselves a musician? What, what support systems exist, period, and what have companies done in the last year to rectify mm. not only what's going on in this moment for musicians, independent artists, record stores, mm. venues, law, etc. But like, no, 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 we've been in heck, right? So one major thing I'm realizing is people do not actually understand how the music industry, which it, to me is kind of like, if you can call anything an industry, you may as well call it an industrial complex. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> love, like big evil and manufacturing that comes in. So there's the music industrial complex, which I've worked for them. And then there's the music business, right? And people don't really understand how either of them work or the mm -hmm. ways they interrelate where they do or how they apply to what we call indie music, where those lines are actually drawn. Yeah. And people really don't understand how in none of those arenas, nothing mm -hmm. is as it seems. And musicians are 
always the last priority on everyone's list. We have yeah. always been last on the list for care. Mm. There's a reason that our shows are sponsored by vodka corporations instead of, <laughs> say, like healthcare companies. Yeah, yeah. Get sponsored shows. So these are all things I'm realizing mm. in the last year. I mean, there is so much hope and there are so many mega realizations. People exist. People want to do cool projects. Things are possible, right? But mm. in terms mm. of major realizations over the last year, some of the more critical ones that I've had have related to just the pure lack of understanding mm. about how music works, how musicians actually make their money, yeah, stuff like that. So major realizations in terms of how tuned out a lot of people are to how how the sausage gets made, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the I mean, I guess that that what you've had to kind of put together because I mean, I, I mean, the other the other thing we you sort of talked about health was that, um, you know, I I, I spoke to um, Barry Ashworth from his band the, the Dub Pistols um, about a mental health um program that he sort of helped well he's, he's he's one of the patrons with terry hall from the specials um and it's about you know because people have a lot of musicians and um people in the music industry it's not just musicians have suffered from mental health issues this sort of past year and he said you know you know i've, I've felt myself you know i've had to do training myself to help me identify some of these warning signals that that come along you said before you know you just kind of like got on with stuff you know and you just did it now it's it's totally changed have you have you have you sort of come across those those sort of any of those sort of issues well i mean yeah definitely everybody's had to develop some new coping mechanisms yeah last year and Again, this is an area where I get really iffy because I tend to think of the wide berth of self-care options afforded. Yeah. The conversation gets regressive and silly kind of quickly. Uh, mm. And the fact that the phrase coping mechanisms is generally used as a pejorative <laughs> kind of bugs Absolutely. me. Absolutely, yeah. But, uh, you know, something I think about a lot is mental health and musicianship, right? Mm. And especially because in that nothing is as it seems way, the way the struggling artist or the wacky artist or the crazy drugged out mm. artist, the he died too young, the romanticization of this, that, and every other thing is like never talked about at the level of responsibility of the handlers of people in that echelon of music, right? Yeah. yeah. And even below that, we're just all on our own when it comes to coping mechanisms. So I don't drink, mm. I'm really boring. <laughs> and I've mm -hmm. spent an inordinate amount of time over the course of my life in terms of studying personal well-being, personal growth, trying to yeah. like not trying to not be a colossal piece of shit in my everyday life and like have <laughs> a terrible experience being a person, the one crazy trip that I have around this weird thing. Um, trying to be a less oppressive person and generally have my shit together so I can mm. remain alive in a world where every third thing is like out to sell you something and every 16th is out to kill you or whatever. Yeah. Um, over the last year. Yeah. I think if I've been hit with anything, it's been doubt because there are so many people to help. I've had to manufacture my ass some new coping mechanisms in terms of dealing with my feelings of have I done enough on this day? Will I ever, when the mm -hmm. entire music industry has melted down, when all the venues are closing, when, you know, UK mm -hmm. stats are pretty much the only ones that exist, but mental health charities were reporting that 70% of musicians would be leaving the business completely during and following COVID because it was fiscally untenable for people. Mm -hmm. I would read those stats and want to work for 18 hours straight, just emailing mm -hmm. every person, reaching out, who do I know, what venue, every venue I've ever played is running through my head in a list 24 seven, what bands, what labels, who can I talk to, who can I talk, who needs me, who needs me, who can I help? Yeah, you know, yeah. Having to physically pull myself off of that ledge, yeah. lest I burn out to such a radical extreme, like Tesla level burnout. Yeah. Nicola, not the other guy. Mm. I had to work on that a little bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> works in progress, let's say. <laughs> but trying to to absolve oneself of when one is in such a position of tremendous privilege mm. and weird power for like a weird hardcore hick from upstate New York. Like mm. I must work 27 hours a day because everyone is in crisis. That's mm. most seriously what I've dealt with over the last year that has been a struggle for me. Do, do, do you feel responsible, you know, and, you know, for 
for the people that I guess that you know, like you said, you know, you know, kind of venues that have supported, you know, anybody that has supported you along the way that you know you still like you still in touch with artists. Yeah. I feel responsible to artists in general and those mm. we associate just simply because it's what I've done since I was 14 years old when I started playing in bands and yeah. since 17 when I started booking shows and going on tours and stuff like that. So mm. I've always felt if I felt anything, it's been a responsibility to the continuance of music outside the monolith complex, you know? Mm. So, yeah, it's definitely a strong feeling of responsibility. It's, since I'm in this position, I must do everything I can. Yeah. yeah. Go, going back to, to um, you know, when you, were, when you were younger, when you were, uh, you know, kind of, kind of growing up, I guess, I mean, the, um, you, you know what 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 sort of what you what your earliest sort of memories of the mindset that you've got now how that that kind of started getting in lots and lots and lots of trouble all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm serious and I, five years ago i would have lied i would have oh you know i was on stage really early yeah you know i grew up in a kind of like normal weird family like totally yeah normal but there was some like community theater and some local journalism in a small town. So like as weird as you get for a really normal place. Um, but my first memory <laughs> of the influences on me and the, the strongest contributions. Okay, I'll put it this way. If I had to explain the kind of person I am now through my very early childhood influences, it would be the public library mm. and my dad's record collection mm. um, because both were just I was presented with chaos on both fronts and told that I could pick I could have my run so mm. my dad's record collection would give me Arrested Development's first full length with Mr. Wendell in Tennessee and all those yeah. tracks on it, and it would give me a cool Keith record and it would also give me Ornette Coleman and The Clash and yeah on down the line and the public library would give me scary stories to tell in the dark history of upstate New York James and the Giant Peach, some Michael Crichton novels, a yeah. bunch of like witchcraft and occult books and like books of Renaissance painting. And I'm like six and the librarians are looking at me like I'm insane, right? Well, yeah, so yeah. the biggest early, oh, and the internet, you know, I, uh, course, I, yeah. I'm old, but I'm old enough to remember the internet of the 1990s. And because my dad was just a huge, huge computer dork and, also, just I should say my dad in general, because like me, he's ardently self-taught. My dad also, he never went to college. He started working as a local reporter as a teenager, and he's just stuck with it his whole life. Right. Probably the smartest guy on the planet. He taught me the importance of self-education. And so even mm. though I was lucky I got to go to college later, um, for whatever that was worth, great time. <laughs> <laughs> the importance of self-education and diverse self-education early, like it was... Yeah. not even impressed upon me it was just ambiently in my oxygen that you had to be able to sing dance read at a college level talk mm -hmm. about avant-garde jazz and like know how to read a list serve by the time i was like mm -hmm. six or seven I'm like this wow. is normal. no wonder i had so many friends growing up um but those are my early influences that really mattered to me were like open access points yeah, one of the, the biggest thing I started to learn about myself really early on is that there would never be anything but hyphens in my world. Like I mm. just literally always done a thousand things. At the same mm. time. Those are the big early influences. Mm -hmm. It's funny. Yeah, I mean, I remember like when I when I was sort of growing up and, and uh, the, the you know my my, my kind of parents sort of came from from nothing really. They didn't they didn't have any any kind of money. Dad had a very kind of quite an unstable, you know, kind of upbringing. And they kind of, well, my dad in particular sort of instilled this, you know, thing about he, he was self educated. He took it upon himself to get educated, he qualified as a mechanical engineer, et cetera. And, and with that, he, you know, kind of financial security was really important to him. But that the education system that I was in was like, you know, kind of reading, writing, arithmetic, three R's, the two of which sort of don't really begin with R, but there you go, you know. But that, that was that was kind of it, you know, and, you know, you know, any kind of like dreams that you had, you know, that that question you get when you're a kid, you know, what, what are you going to be when you grow up, get to school, it's like kicked out of you. It's like, right, you've got to study, 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 read, 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 write. 
it did not have that effect on me. It didn't. And like, I did great in school. I was that kid. I was the kid who I had pretty much straight A's and detention every yeah. day. I was always <laughs> in trouble. I was skipping school, skipping school to like show up at my dad's office though. <laughs> like, I was stupid. I was a really stupid kid. I mouthed off. Um, and I had a blast and I had great grades. I did all the musicals. I was always in trouble. Right? Yeah. So so what, what, when when you were kind of like going going through school and you were kind of like you know you're acing everything but sort of getting into tons of shit and and stuff like that you know kind of like what what did you what looking back now what did you what do you remember of what how you envisaged envisioned your life you know what? oh i live every day and i have for a really long time i used to make this joke and I'm not even sure if it was a joke at first or serious at this point, but I mm. live to vindicate my 14 year old self. 14 year old me knew more than 33 year old me. <laughs> 14 year old me knew everyone in the music industry is a liar. Everyone is a liar and a predator. <laughs> truth, right? Like 14 year old me knew that for sure. I had to go through some growth phases. The galaxy brain comes back to everyone is a liar and a predator. <laughs> <laughs> so like, 14 year old me looked around and was like, I don't actually think I'm going to be choosing one job because I already knew based on the lists of jobs with which I'd been presented by that point in my life, I was good at absolutely none of them. None of those. Yeah. What I was good at was singing and getting in trouble mm. and hanging out and like writing. And I had a lot of fun doing those things. And I also knew that being a writer wasn't a career. Okay, that had been crammed down my throat no matter how many books I'd read that seemed like they were written by very real people for whom it was their job. <laughs> Correct? Yeah. So I was kind of from an early age, really always thinking in terms of like, what is enjoyable, what is possible, mm. what am I good at? And I actually didn't ever perceive, even as a child, a need to, I had examples of people around me who did not follow that path and turned out fine. Yeah. You know, like there was no choosing for my father. He didn't go to school and get a degree and become the thing. Like he went to radio and television and print and like did a bunch of different things. He fell into what he loved. Okay, cool. My mother had switched careers a bunch. She went from being a stage actress to working in education. Like mm. I had very few examples around me of anyone who just like did it that way. And also, okay, so where I grew up is incredibly crucial to this because that also yeah. wasn't the narrative that we were fed. I am from an incredibly impoverished cross section of far rural upstate New York where the military is the single largest employer and you have army recruiters swarming your building like carpenter wasps. Yeah. So like, no, 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 we don't get you choose a career. We get Army, Navy, or Air Force. And most mm. of my friends ended up in Iraq and Afghanistan. So mm. also where you are from definitely like impacts the way you have career. So it was basically like, I'm clearly not a candidate for the military. George W. Bush became president and I was trying to sneak down to the protests in our town square. So I was clearly not doing this shit, correct? But, you know, there was no alternative really. So would it, would it, is it, I mean, is it, is it fair to say that you, you, you would sort of feel yourself sort of this phrase paddling against the tide or paddling against the flow you know that because the, the there was there was this this kind of you know environment that you were living in it seemed like everyone else was paddling against it to be honest so you, okay that's interesting it really did that's none interesting of it, none of it i all like i didn't have a pleasant time i was not popular i did not fit in everyone has always kind of been like that is the loud obnoxious person who sits in the corner and talks with you like i've always been this way right yeah but no one really looked like they were having that great a time mm. you know, i'm very glad i did not peak in high school for one and i think you know a lot of young people <laughs> could stand to have it impressed upon them that there's more to life than where they currently are for that reason mm. um but no it seemed like the people who were struggling were the ones who were forcing themselves to do things like choose careers at 15. that's so interesting god forbid deal with the struggle of going into an active war zone in my situation which was something my childhood friends were facing yeah. when we were children yeah going into an active war zone right that's that's so, it that's it uh that I, I think I think that's really I'm glad you mentioned you know your you know the you know the town that you sort of grew up in um because I, I agree with you I think I think that's that's sort of really important to you know I, I was well I was I am an only child right and you know I kind of you know sort of felt this this sort of pressure you know almost like a kind of pressure to conform you know from yeah, either I I, a loser 
<laughs> yeah. I think I was kind of a loser. Like I didn't feel weird about it. It was very apparent from a really young age. Maybe that's like the funniest and easiest way to put it. Yeah. I had been picked on for so long. But I, I, what I what I love is that so long. I, I love the way that you sort of flipped it around and and you know you see the other ones as kind of like well you know no I'm going in the right direction. I think that's like incredibly resilient and sort of strong minded. It was, it was that or die. Yeah. You know, literally. Literally. Or, Literally, or like by career choice, yeah. or by self-destruction. Yeah. Self-destruction was another option that was apparently presented to a lot of my peers that some of them chose. Yeah, I did not. But I can't look back on that part of my life and say that I knew with any certainty what would happen. I mm. knew I wanted to play guitar. Mm. I knew I wanted to be around people that thought like me. Yeah. I knew I wanted to be loosed of what I felt were utterly arbitrary social constraints like the new forms of pressures that come when you're living in a heavily evangelical area or a heavily mm. militarized area like what yeah. happens to your life when undue institutional influence reigns over like the geographical area where you live you know yeah. i just wanted to bounce and because i had had that early access to media and i'd been able to read about different artistic movements and places in the world and i had the internet really early i knew there was more to life out there and yeah. felt a very strong personal responsibility to try not to die until I figured out whether or not I could get there myself. Mm. So I can't say that I was like an exceptional child or did anything particularly cool except persevere in refusing to be bored. It's interesting because I, I like the the town that I grew up in the town in, in the north of England and um, I remember like my mum telling me that like when I basically sort of left school and then went to uni to study mm -hmm. She she said you could not wait to get out of that door, and go away. And just then, it was obviously the first time that I'd been away and, and and sort of lived it lived away from home. She said you could not wait to do it, and and that was the the kind of the start for me, of, I guess you know kind of becoming myself and and sort of living away. And I, you you know your environment is is so important for that, and kind of like you know you're surrounding yourself by people that you choose and that you want to be around mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when did when did when you now when did you leave your hometown oh i went well <laughs> <laughs> a couple different times um i left for the first time so it's more interesting i went to school when i was 17 but i didn't go far i went even further upstate to an even smaller town that put me in right. closer proximity to montreal Mm. closer proximity to people from other places in the country that were in bands already or wanted yeah. to start with me so I could shift my schedule around tour on the weekends I started living in different states during the summer stuff like that yeah when I really <laughs> left home I was 14 mm. and that was when I went from our junior high school to our high school yeah. and made friends with the one thing that I didn't have were friends with cars or friends of age enough to access some of the very few things that were available to us. When mm. that happened, I left the immediate area of rurality that you're kind of st plastered within if you don't have a way to get around and yeah. began to find in the larger district and county and surrounding counties we're talking 40 50 60 miles away sometimes yeah the at every other school mm, okay oh so this is the golden era of like myspace <laughs> and aol instant messenger and all of a sudden the oh, combination wow. of the internet and a couple of other people who had heard of like placebo yes <laughs> yes and, and <laughs> and like uh, fishbone and I, yeah. was off. I was gone i was never actually there i was yeah. mentally gone i was like all the rules were finally out the window i was like all right i got friends who like lydia lunch i am 14 years old it is 2001 yeah and i'm free wow and from there on it was all bad choices that <laughs> resulted in literally what i do for a living now uh but yeah, 14 years old. 14 years old was when I made a friend with an old blue Mercedes, like a 60s assault style, like real heavy front with a broken mm. cassette player. And we would drive around and listen to Cadillaca and like all the pre Slater Kinney bands. Oh. And uh, I played jazz tapes. We'd listen to David Allen Co. And we'd drive yeah. around being bad. And we, you know, the worst thing we would do is end up at this crappy 24 hour diner to eat eggs. We're back in <laughs> People still smoke indoors. That's how long ago it was. But 
that was when I was really gone because that was when, you know, I'm really tall. So by the time I was 14, I could lie and say that I was 16 to get into the 18 and up show. Yeah. Yeah. Drink so I could go see the murder junkies or, you know, Motorhead or like yeah. whatever state fair bands as well. Um, but I could also, you know, get around a little freer. I had a few mm-hmm. older friends who knew more stuff, you know, who's this person? They want to tell me about what Diane Arbus. Wow. <laughs> it's really cool. I had older friends that that liked Alice Neal and they liked art. They were painters and stuff like that. You know, I'm 14. It's 2001. It's a different yeah. time. I am amazed. I've been alone my whole life. And I'm now I have, you know, people who listen to Crass and Flux of Pink Indians and want to talk yeah. about oil painting. I'm, what the hell? Like my, you have to, over half my life ago, my mind is blown. I've exploded. And I already liked weird stuff. I just, I had never met anyone else who wanted to talk about any yeah. of it. And they knew so much more than I did. How did, and, how did, how did that make you feel at, at, at that kind of age? Angry. <laughs> angry. <laughs> mad as shit at everyone i don't know enough i need to know more that also i knew it i knew i wasn't a total loser yeah i knew it i knew that when i was 12 and every boy in my class called me disgusting and i knew it when i was eight and the seventh graders on the bus would you know throw me up against the seats and call me weird and a freak i knew it the boy who turned me down for like the eighth grade dance who said I had man eyebrows or whatever, you know, it was like Mm. everyone that ever called me a loser for reading on the bus when I was a kid, you know, I turned 14 and I was just kind of like angry for myself. Mm. But that anger is like a huge motivator and anger has been a core, you know, it went really early on because of this from something that consumed me and threatened to take my life to the core theme of a lot of my work that in later years that anger got me you know on stage in front of a hundred thousand people in portugal mm. so what's the problem did you I just did, learn to work with it and that's what age does did you did you use that anger in a um you used that in a kind of constructive way and you sort of felt, obviously felt vindicated you know when you amongst these people that are kind of like okay these are my these are my people yeah yeah, yeah, and it makes it a lot easier to do the thing where you kind of say, "No, the rest of you are swimming upstream." Yeah, yeah. You know, because my life did my life no longer felt like so much of a struggle. Mm. I I was no longer even slightly under the impression there was a chance I would be an isolated loser everywhere I went for the rest of my life, and that was enough to kill high school four years. Mm. Okay, whatever. I'd been at it like fifteen at that point. <laughs> What's a couple more? kind of kind of you know hearing that makes makes me makes me sort of you know think about i mean you all say you know kind of kids are cruel and stuff like that but it makes me think about the the you know what 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 causes that you know the, the kind of societal norms and sort of framework that 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 we have that we put kids into that causes things like that you know, I'm to... not even saying I was a special and great kid and no one mm. should have been mean to me because I was an illustrious jackass with a hot mouth <laughs> and an inability to follow directions. And I I have not changed really at all. <laughs> like way, way out of control sometimes when I was a kid, just like absolutely so irritating. I know this. I'm not saying I shouldn't have been bullied at various points in my life for some of the stupid choices that I made. But... <laughs> I knew that it didn't have to kill me. Yeah. So that was okay. Yeah. And and those, those um, you know, those sort of um, sort of choices that you were you were making as you as you kind of like you know, fell into into, you know, your your kind of people, you know, how how did you then um. Was it was it like like a like a thorough kind of like welcoming? It's like sort of come in, you you you're sort of one of us, and you just that that was the that was the the group of people that you then knew, and and sort of evolved with. No, I think what happened was that's actually that's a fabulous question because actually what it taught me, insofar as there are other people that are like me, is very specifically there are other people who don't feel like 
group affiliation is the core of human experience. It is mm. every single one of these people is an individual. Mm. And that actually, here are other examples of people just a couple of years to decades older than myself, who turned out fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cases, but in other cases, truly fine. Uh, wonderful. People mm. are, oh, um, it was actually that congealed identity isn't a prerequisite for joy is what mm -hmm. I learned from those people because someone runs off to join a political campaign or work on an organic farm someone else goes to college mm -hmm. it was actually kind of the exact opposite it was my first chance to truly be around people who didn't actually in some cases in like the fringes of the people that I associated with as a young teenager um you know we had friends deploying no it wasn't group identification it was actually a willingness to let go that was yeah. so abstract about the people that I knew they wanted to make poetry zines and then burn them and that's part of the thing you know there was some of that and then there was some of the hesitation of a socially impoverished upbringing and also the realities of the surroundings again like mm. things were unpredictable everyone wanted to get out of where we were so attachment wasn't really the style mm. what they introduced me to early was the comfort of being myself because we're in that kind of group, a group of fascinated people. Mm. The people for me are the people who are fascinated. Like there is something to learn about everything, right? You start to associate with people like that and you realize fascination is mobile and it can always be added to. People can come in and out. You know, you start to hang around enough punk people. You meet some crazy train hopper kids that show up once a year. Mm. You know, people yeah. can come in and out. That's a differentiating factor. You, you you mentioned then about you know kind of being comfortable in yourself do, do you do you think that you know your your because I, I mean I, th I think identity is is sort of hugely important um and, and finding that identity do you feel that like sort of over over the years that your your identity has has changed yeah i feel like i mean it's constantly evolving that it might be a little bit of spiritual paralysis and like the limits of language but change is identity yeah people who don't get that are worrisome yeah. <laughs> <A lot of laughs> um, identity yeah doesn't doesn't have to mean what you think it means it can mm. be like one should recognize the identity as a fluid and malleable thing even mm. if only like by virtue of your direct experience i was a child mm. no longer it's no longer my identity but was i one yeah definitely mm. right like i like at the beginning of i was the host of mtv news i am now the director of music at kickstarter are i are those parts of my identity or are they work or what are they as soon as you actually start to think about the world all of these arguments kind of fall apart mm. so i think change is necessary for identity and the way I envision it in my head is kind of like a a well in the middle of a garden mm. that you have to guard. That well that is functionally empty, save for when the water comes up into it and can be used and then drains and then fills and then drains. That's the who you are part. Mm. The identity is like who's coming to the well, what's growing in the garden. You know, it's that zero sum in the middle that's yeah. who you are. It's the undiscoverable. The undiscoverable column, air and water moving through it, is the self. It is constant movement. It's constant inhalation and exhalation and constant change. Identity, well, that's where my work as a witch comes in, as opposed to everything. <laughs> that's the ongoing, because once you unlock that, or rather, unlocking that is one way to get into magic, among other things. But like mm. starting to play with and also no one has to listen to a single word I'm saying, of course, if anyone even is, because identity, the idea that it is, according to your definition, is kind mm. of the key part of it. But how I see identity is you're, you're identifying as different things in different moments, right? Identity is, yeah. a, it's a language, it's like an image set, kind of. Yeah, I think if, if there's anybody that's listened to more than one episode of of, of the this this podcast, they'll probably probably sort of turn off now. But uh, what, there's, there's one quote that I really love. Um, from uh, Nelson Mandela, and it's basically the idea that you only have to see how much you've changed is by going back to a place that hasn't changed. There. I think, like, when I go back to my hometown where I was brought up, I think, wow. I, I, and, you, you know, I mean, that, that, that physically that town has changed in, 
in some ways in the sort of center like lots of places have but in other ways it's it's the same and I think back, I, I'm like, wow. It, it just brings back lots of kind of memories. And I don't know if it, it's probably, I don't know whether it's sort of getting older, you know, the brain sort of becomes softer or what, but it, it's, I just think it's, I just find it really interesting sort of thinking back, you know, visiting those sort of places that you either went to as a child or you lived and they haven't changed. And you see, you, you see yourself then and, and now. You're getting a little bit philosophical, but I, I I just think it's interesting. It's time travel. And it can be that same question as like, is what you're doing now satisfactory to your mm. self? How much, that's the kind of place I'm interested in investigating in terms of where I look to see how much I've changed. Yeah. Or, have or haven't, or really not have I, it's not binaristic, it's auditing. Yeah. Auditing my beliefs between then and now, where have I ended up as a result of that in terms of have I grown? what's changed what's changed by my hand what's changed that oops i shouldn't have let that happen what do I yeah you know that's a lot of it for me with with your um your kind of creativity you know the the the, the various sort of projects that you're involved with mm-hmm. and I, th- I think there's there's probably a lot that you're involved with at any given time at any given time my life's a nightmare <laughs> <laughs> talk about it let's talk about it then let's talk about it how many projects have you got on the go at present um well even just disciplinary in terms of like disciplines in addition to my regular job at present i am also well i'm deep in my cultural research in addition to my personal practice so currently i'm working on a presentation for a conference that's going to be announced soon which has a multimedia culture component i have my my individual research practices i also have my gardening my amateur botany and my orchids i have my seamstressing and tailoring that i do i am a i'm a cardomancer i read cards i'm a writer still um and all of these things and more are going on at any given time in addition to my full-time job, which in addition to being the director of music at Kickstarter, I am also the uh, self-appointed lead of a really wonderful community endeavor that we have spun up in the three years that I've been there called Witch Starter that seeks to investigate the role that a culture actually plays in crowdfunding and art on the internet. And it also allows me to do community outreach and assistance like I do for the music community for the larger world of witchcraft. People who are doing things on Kickstarter like making rit- ritual magical implements or tarot decks or other divination devices. Mm. So at any given time, my job is balancing a bunch of artists across a bunch of disciplines. And then I may be fermenting a tincture with one hand and trying to pin a sleeve on. T- I made the blouse that I'm wearing. <laughs> like, wow, amazing. Remaking, remaking a lot of my clothes, getting rid of a lot of pre-made clothes. Some days yeah. it's, you know, we're trucking off to shoot a short film or we're going to work in a garden. You know, I'm, I'm always cooking. It's difficult to count how many things. I'm wow, that's that. incredible. How, I mean, I'm sure you get asked this a lot, but how do you keep all that going? I mean, that's, that's. Uh, I have to. This is what you enjoy, but this is this is you. This is who I what am. You, you enjoy. What I really like is motion. Yeah. What I really like is consumption. I like to have as little time possible allotted every day for arbitration, worry, and fear. Point. Yeah. If I have the time, I'm going to fill it with something. I have too many interests. I have too many more things to learn to be a more effective helper of people. I have too many dreams. I have too many people out there in the world who I idolize and I desperately want to work with. And so I have to keep making cool shit so they like me or like something. Yeah. I uh, I have to feed myself, you know, also I have to get dressed every day. So why not be an active participant in my life to the degree that I can? That's Mm. how I always, how does this work? How do plants grow? How does food get on the table? Mm. things come together Mm. that's always been my fascination i want to break everything but only so i can see it in its constituent parts so i can replicate it or fix it or hack it or kind of put it together how can i reconstruct the universe to be closer to the idea of what i think i would like how can i keep everything mobile that's why i do what i do i like one thing it's magic (laughs) <laughs> I like building worlds. I like recreating my surroundings to make them more suitable for me. I mean, it sounds like you have, you have this this kind of like endless curiosity 
in in life and things that you you want to understand how they how they work and then rebuild or build again or just understand how things fit together does that does that help you kind of like understand your life you know what it what it means what it means to be you absolutely i think if there's a meaning of my life at least in the current moment you know if me, the meaning of life for a personal moment, yeah if it's as easy as identifying an identity or something like that yeah um, the constant quest for knowledge that every day i wake up is one less day that i have to learn stuff yeah, that's and true yeah. human history and everything that's yet to be discovered and every work of fiction that's never been written and every everything like oh my god humans have been around for like two hundred thousand years i have mad catching up to do is the feeling i wake up with every morning of my life and the feeling that i hit every night by the time i fall asleep on top of a book right mm. that's me i have to be engaged all the time i mean this is this is really incredible because i think that the the, the, the you, you know for a lot of people um i mean i've kind of like sort of studied how people i st say studied about how people make decisions. I'm not, I'm not eminently qualified in it, but I've, you know, I've kind of like done some research into how people make decisions and the, um, you know, kind of, you know, means like things like climate change, why people don't take action now is because they can't see that far in the future. You know, it's, it's like something that's on the horizon. I think there's that quote from the, it was the governor of the bank of England, he called it the tragedy of the horizon is because people see, can't see, what's happening beyond that kind of horizon i think people have issues with the brain kind of understanding time time distances of time but you seem to have like very clearly that i'm on this planet for this length of time and i'm going to make the most of it i need i have this quest for for kind of knowledge which i think is is, is pretty unique my clock runs backwards i think it always has every mm. day I Watching, like a, an hourglass mm. you know it's never about i will i've never had the i will live forever rock and roll feeling like yeah live fast die young is like no 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 like race every day to be as good as humanly possible and come out better informed sleep as little as you can get up and do it again because someday you can't yeah hmm that seems to kind of be how i've always felt like life should be lived or at least it's the way i guess i've always done things in hindsight yeah yeah do you, do you find um you know as you as you get older that you you take more risks less risks different risks different different risk huge risk for me to be in corporate mm. huge yes risk. Never yeah. Done before. yeah person with explosive interests diversity wise content wise yeah. person who creatively has hinged my career on what i find enjoyable which is making horrifically offensive things with people i like yeah yeah Me going to corporate it's a risk to everything right i pose a risk yeah. to this company just by showing up just by showing up every day actually pretty nice i think i do <laughs> but it's a risk to my time it's a risk to you know if you do so many things how do you choose which you're going to do every day yeah did i you know these were all questions that i had before i started working there you know yeah it's a risk it's a risk for me to do the most different thing i could possibly do which would be mm. settled into one position for a while mm -hmm. but risk doesn't equal regret any more than stress equals bad yeah you no know? but i take different risks now um and regret few of my past ones i also don't see them as being fundamentally different i think they're different manifestations of my same drive for mm. increased risk which is definitely a problem that i have had in my life which i like to put myself in increasingly tense situations cool if being on stage in front of a bazillion people playing violent offensive music that occasionally got me in huge trouble wasn't enough, I then put myself on TV in front of millions of people every day. Now mm -hmm. I work for this big company that's like a huge responsibility to help a ton of people every day. Mm -hmm. Their creative life is hinging on our platform in some instances. It's a big responsibility and responsibility comes with risk a lot of the time and vice versa. I, I mean, you, you, you may think differently, but you, you could you could argue that you being on stage 
you know, in a hardcore noise band is challenging your audience. Maybe. Argue. You could also argue that like in Kickstarter, you challenge you, you what you're doing, you're challenging your um, I don't know, let's call them clients, but you know, to improve themselves and to, you know, kind of take risks themselves to to if they've got any kind of doubts or hesitation about a project that they're working on, now fuck it. Let's let's do it. And this is why we should do it. Yeah. I do a lot of that. Mm. I think that that's my favorite my favorite part of the job is the fact that I get to talk to artists all day. Yeah. And about where they are in their projects and actually it's feels a little soul eatery to say one of my favorite parts of this job is hearing from people about their problems yeah and what's bothering them but when we talk about these problems when we talk about where we have hiccups in our practices whether that's I have creative doubt or I'm actually stuck because I've hit a part of the physical manufacturing process that is out of my league yeah. or whatever it is, only by talking about those things can we find creative solutions to get around them. And so it's a great joy and a privilege every day to mm. have the kind of job that allows me the time to sit and listen when people want to talk about their issues. And then it is also my job to back them up and support them and try to find ways to help them with their issues, whether that is creative encouragement, tech mm -hmm. support, or something in between, which is what I usually end up doing a lot of the time. You know? used to, I mean, I mean that that way of you, you, like you say, you know, just kind of like, okay, let's get the let's get the problem out there, and let's let's talk about it, let's work it out. You're right. I mean, that's that's the way that you kind of solve things, and you sort of move forward in in everything in your life. But there are so many, you know, the want to, you know, not face those and sort of like hide away from them and and hope that they will go away, and they don't. In that way, I'm a sort of exorcist midwife because <laughs> <laughs> the problem ain't going away it's coming out <laughs> right it's gonna come out. um but it is a bit of a get behind me scene you know yeah no 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 no. the problem they're invisible they're in the astral realm you know we're gonna get them out and we're gonna get them gone and we're gonna mm. move them on. no matter what the problems are no matter how big they are i try to go to the mat for people Mm. I like that you said clients. I don't think I've ever used that word in my no, life. No, I know. I, 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 it was heat of the moment. I couldn't think of any other word. It's really good. It actually makes me feel incredibly professional, which <laughs> these opportunities, I take them when they arrive. <laughs> I talk about, uh, with Kickstarter specifically, I always like to talk about the creators that I work with. The creators that you work in with. In general, you. I just say, I work with artists. Or my problem is I'll be in a meeting and I'll say, I'll, you know, the reverse is like, I was talking to my friend the other, a creator that I'm working with. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is my buddy. It's another wizard. It's a buddy. Yeah. That's me too. Just to just to finish off, and it's been been absolutely amazing talking to you. But you you, you made a like you said just a, just a couple of minutes ago. You made a choice. Uh, you know you you to to join Kickstarter, which was a risk for you. For anybody sort of like going the other way, which is sort of what I did. Uh, but, or but anybody that's that's wanting to sort of make those sort of changes is, is there a, a piece of advice that you could give somebody if they, if they're struggling if they have an obstacle that's stopping them from from doing it yeah i mean i could say a lot of different things and mm. were it a more particular situation with a person in a more particular struggle i could but um here's a witch tip. Yep. Here's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful phrase that you can apply to the voice in your own head all of the time when you're experiencing doubt and you can use it in fractal situations. And I often do when I'm faced with like, I have a huge project. Oh my FG, it's so big. How am I ever going to get this done? I have no qualifications. I'm a garbage bag full of weasels. Like, what am I doing here? Right? <laughs> Four magic words. Who told you that? Yeah. Who told you that? And other variations on it, like, where did that come from? Or can I get a source? Ask. <laughs> Ask yourself those <laughs> questions. It's, it's, I'm, I'm laughing, but like, it's really, really deadly serious, right? That's true. Yeah. So much of the time, 
we are bound by a phenomenology that isn't, it might be in line with our direct experience, but our mind and our mental patterns are humongous contributors to our direct experience. And the longer you tell yourself something, the faster it's going to become fact. And the faster that fact gets bolted to the walls of the inside of your head, True. you might have to do some remodeling before you get on with your life change, right? Yeah. People think they can change their lives without changing their mindset. When a lot of the time, what's prevented a change thus far is the mindset and not any practical problem that maybe you've even convinced yourself is true via the mindset. Let's kick it back to what we were talking about before we got on the recorded part of this call with this mm. podcast, where mm. you told me you put it off forever and ever and ever. Yeah. You were super like, I'm going to start a podcast. Ah, and then you said, and then I finally did it and I loved it. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> yes. you know, I know problems starting a podcast and now in second season you're kicking off some taking names right but like yeah. were your were your hurdles it doesn't feel good to say your challenges are imaginary if someone said that to me i would go upside their head right yeah but there has to be a way a gentler way and this is where we curve it to the situation that's necessary to let people in on when mm. their demons are just like you know clown level mm. When, when, when you have the ability to look at someone and say, I have wonderful news for you. You made that up. Mm. Who told you that? Told Here's you that. 10 bits of evidence to the contrary. People who are faced with a change who are struggling over it are usually dealing with something at the phenomenological level that doesn't line up with either their experience of how things have been, as in like, mm. I couldn't possibly do that because these past experiences dictate what I can do in the future or what they think about the world at large. People yeah. can't do this. No one's done this. Or That's if true. I did yeah. this, everyone would think X, Y, Z of me. Yeah. Challenging the parts of your concern that can't be nailed down to fact. Asking why of Wonderful. anything that you feel is true at least four or five times. Say, yeah. if, if you end up with, well, because this, well, why? Mm. Well, because this, well, why? Yeah usually within four jumps of why or who told you that or cite your source you realize well because someone said that to me my whole life or yeah. well because i don't think anyone thinks i'm cute or well because now what's past that what's on the other side of that fence that's per individual that's and per individual oh, it's a very frightening frigging place to get to where if you're yeah. able to do that, that's not your fix, right? Because right. that's also like an entry point for existential dread. If every time you face a problem, you think, oh, I'm gonna change my life and I'm gonna implement this new thing where I ask myself why I believe these things. And if every single time you do that, you get to a level where you're like, oh my God, life is meaningless. I'm in the abyss, this is a mm -hmm. void. Like you have to be able to get to the why that brings you back out of that too. It can't just become yeah. an existential wasteland. But at the same time, you will be surprised in whatever challenge you're facing at the moment or whichever ones you may face going forward, how powerful questioning your own accepted truths yeah. will actually go in terms of just being able to get up the next morning, put on a new job, like a pair of shoes and walk out the front door. Yeah, yeah. Because who, whoever told you that you couldn't do these things yeah. is probably dead. A random citation in a textbook, yeah. someone whose life doesn't look a single thing like yours, or someone who's having less fun than you. And the yeah. last one is what you have to watch out for. I think, I think that's brilliant. I think that's brilliant, you know, kind of like challenging your belief system and what, um, who told you that? is is the perfect way to go i mean that's 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 brilliant that's like just something easy to remember and it's a constant challenge who told you that well who told you well, that? Also, also recognize that sometimes it, it's a good question to ask because you'll go my boss and that's why i'm doing it and that's why yeah or yeah someone i idolize yeah I should do this. I should, I should um, make a point for me. Let's I'll use an actual example for my life, right? I should make a point to label before I cut pieces out of fabric, mm. which side is my right side and which side is my wrong side. Because if the pieces are mirror images, like if I'm making a blouse like this and yeah. the fabric looks the same on both sides, I'm going to make mistakes. Yeah. Who told you that? A brilliant seamstress I follow on YouTube. Gonna do that. Really easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I'm going to make a point to question my choices in a more nuanced way every day. Who told you that? Well, Manly P. Hall. So I'll be doing that. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> oh, who told you that? HR from Bad. All right. Rocking on in the free world. Let's go. Right. Yeah. But most of the time, it's like, who told you that? Someone who turned out to be a creep. Someone yeah. who doesn't look like they're having very much fun. Someone yeah. who represents things that I actually personally just don't care about. Mm hmm. Who told you that someone with different goals than you very true very okay. true so ra I, I only advise this in lieu of telling people big sweeping things like start yeah. by figuring out what your goals are start by graphing out what your purpose is in life start by questioning the shit that's already in your head because it's like head. everything else cleaning and clearing and making room is the first step to like actual achievable growth it's not yeah. necessarily planning and adding and adding and adding and adding if what's underneath is yes. raw meat piling yeah. frosting on it will not make it a birthday cake absolutely absolutely you gotta, you gotta get the basics nailed down and i advise cleaning house especially like psychically <laughs> yeah i think that's, that's i think that's i think that's fantastic i mean that's just brilliant it's a good exercise. At the very least, it'll make you feel weird. Yeah. You should do things that make you feel weird inside as often as possible. Just get out of that comfort zone and just feel weird. How comfortable are you? Mm. Is often my question. Are you comfortable? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Could you be more comfortable? Would that take a little effort? Does that yeah. seem weird? Like, let's go from there. That's yeah, no, for whole sure. Other whole other conversation. Wow, that's incredible. Meredith, thank you so much. Thank, thank you for having me. This is not at all. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been so much fun. I, I've learned so much from, from listening to you and talking to you. It's been, been incredible. So thank you for asking good questions. Again, and listen, best, best, best of luck with uh, at, at Kickstarter as well. I'm sure you'll continue to be, you know, a huge success there. So best of luck with it. Take care. Thank you. Not at all. See you soon. Thanks for listening to the show, and I really hope that you enjoyed it and that you'll tune in for the next episode. In the meantime, it would be really awesome if you could rate and review the show and also share it with any friends who you think might enjoy it.